Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Rosebro. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Now, the impact of the COVID-19 global pandemic well, has been devastating for some people. And uh, the, the economies are in a slump. They're in a recession and things like this. So what is a pastor to do in the midst of a problem like this? Well, um, apparently there's some guys who think it's a good idea to misappropriate the resurrection and think and tr convince people that God's going to resurrect their businesses or their dead dreams and stuff like that. Yeah, uh, you don't believe me? Well, you'll you'll see here in a second. What we're going to do today, we're going to go visit two churches. And uh, one is uh, called Awaken Church, formerly C3 Church San Diego. And uh, we're not exactly sure what has caused the name change to Awaken Church. Uh, but we're going to be uh, listening to Jürgen Mathesius as he uh, tells us that uh, God told him to preach about God being the God of awakening. And then we'll go back to Easter Sunday, throw in another Easter thing. We'll go to Venue Church as we listen to Tabner Smith um, really misappropriate the resurrection in the same way. It, kind of a common thing now, but this is a form of scratching itching ears and making promises for God that he hasn't made. And I'll warn you up front that when it comes to Tabner Smith, uh, he's another one of these fellows who is manipulating the uh, YouTube uh, copyright system uh, in order for the purposes of uh, you know it, it, well he just it doesn't want us critiquing him and so uh, we will be transforming him and his you know for the purpose of making it so that uh, we're purposely transforming so that we clearly are unambiguously way beyond what's required regarding fair use for this guy. Uh, because uh, he likes to uh, harass us when we, um, we we offer critiques. So you get the idea. So that's what we're going to do today. If you haven't already, uh, like the video, uh, you know, hit the subscribe button and uh, ring the bell and all those juicy things that go along <laughs> with what you're supposed to do on YouTube. And uh, so let's pull this up, and uh, we're going to start at Awaken Church, which is formerly C3 Church San Diego. And uh, we're going to listen to the opening part of this at normal speed. We'll speed a little bit through the part where he's reading scripture. I don't have any problem with a pastor, you know, reading out a biblical text. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, But what he does with it is really weird. We'll be commenting along the way. And so we're g these will be two salient examples of uh, misappropriating the resurrection, which is a form of scratching, itching ears. So uh, let's get to it. Here is uh, Jürgen Mathesius. Hey, welcome to Awaken Church. I am so thrilled that you tuned in today. I'm telling you today, you're going to hear an incredible word. God spoke this word. <laughs> do, do you have to advertise ahead of time? I mean, I preach sermons every Sunday, actually every weekend. And uh, I, I don't have to sit there and start off my sermon. This is going to be an incredible sermon. Um, don't you let people, like, make that decision for themselves, whether or not it was incredible or just okay or things like that. Why do you have to, like, tell everybody, oh, this is going to be the best thing ever? Seems manipulative. Tooting your own horn kind of stuff. Anyway, back this up because I want you to hear uh, what he's going to also say here because this is weird. Welcome to Awaken Church. I am so thrilled that you tuned in today. I'm telling you today, you're going to hear an incredible word. God spoke this word to me a few weeks ago. He, he what? G God spoke this word to you. All right. So I, I want to point out how this then manipulates people and binds their consciences and stuff. All right. So Jürgen Mathesius is one of the fellows we refer to as those who glow in the dark. Okay, now if you don't glow in the dark, well, it's your fault because you don't have enough faith, you're not obedient enough, you haven't leaned in enough, you haven't activated the proper things or whatever. But Jürgen Mathesius, he's, he's done enough and he's activated the thingy. And so now God talks to him directly and th stuff. And so this is a word directly from God. But watch how this then plays out. So you sit there and you go, all right, 
and uh, that's weird, Pastor Jurgen. What you said doesn't square with Scripture. Oh, God, oh, oh. see, now here's the problem. You can't question or challenge him. Why? Because to question or challenge him or what he says here is to question or challenge God himself. And so, you know, most people will sit there and go, well, God told him this. I mean, who are we to say that he didn't and stuff? But see, the thing is, this is manipulation. Mm -hmm. uh, claiming direct revelation from God like this? Yeah, because what this does is it completely circumvents the ability for there to be real biblical Berean work here. And this technically would fall into the category then of what? Of, well, direct revelation. This would be a prophetic word. Yeah, you're supposed to test those things, but... Yeah, people nowadays don't. So this is a this is a weird one. So yeah, he's claiming direct revelation from God. Let's repeat again, just because I'm getting old and repeating helps me remember things. <clears throat> Church, I am so thrilled that you tuned in today. I am telling you today, you are going to hear an incredible word. God spoke this word to me a few weeks ago, especially now that the world and especially United States of America and specifically where we live, San Diego in California, is beginning to awaken from the shutdown, from the lockdown, from the isolation, literally from the devastation that this pandemic put our country, our city and the world into. But you need to understand that God is a God of awakening. What do you mean by that? Can you take me to a biblical text in context and actually engage in proper exegesis and, and, and so that you can help me come to the conclusion that God is a God of awakening? That's vague. It's really vague. And why do I feel like you're going to be scratching, itching ears here? Now, by the way, if you're not familiar with that concept, scratching, itching ears, uh, this is a, a concept directly from a prophecy given by the Apostle Paul in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I'll back this up in context so that you can see here the job of a pastor. This is part of uh, the body of work in the New Testament known as the pastoral epistles. So this is written to young Pastor Timothy, and therefore applies to all pastors. You kind of get the idea. And so the Apostle Paul tells young Pastor Timothy, as for you, continue in what you've learned, have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it. By the way, this is the last letter Paul writes before he loses his head. Uh, and, uh, and so how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, and all Scripture, all Scripture, the Bible, you know? So you know it, as Paul's getting ready to, to die, to be martyred for the Christian faith, what does he point Pastor Timothy to? The Bible, you know? So all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's theonoustos, and it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So that being said then, so Paul then says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, are you ready? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. And here's the reason why. For the time is coming, and I would argue it's here already, uh, when people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching. Uh, didaskalios here can be translated as doctrine, but people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. I don't want to hear about sin. I don't want to hear about Jesus. I don't want to be told to repent. I want to be told that God's going to resurrect my dead business that got killed by the coronavirus pandemic. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> so, having itching ears, uh, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they will turn away from listening to the truth, and they will wander off into myths. Mm hmm. So must you know? So you got to preach the word. You got to you got to teach what's in accord with sound doctrine. In season, out of season, there'll be a time when people won't even want to hear it. They won't endure it. They will want their ears scratched. They will want their ears tickled. So why? Oh, why do I feel like this is what Jurgen Mathesius is doing here? 
fact, if you look at the seasons, there is a winter every single year. There's right, a winter. Every- Going to back this up for context sake. So God is a God of awakening. He God revealed this to him just a couple weeks ago. This is fresh off the press, if you would. Put our country, our city, and the world into. But you need to understand that God is a God of awakening. In fact, if you look at the seasons, there is a winter every single year. There's Yeah, there is. Unless, of course, you live near the equator. <laughs> then, then, you know, you, you don't really... Yeah, never mind. Okay, we... We continue. This is notice even on planet Earth, this isn't exactly a universal thing here. Winter every single year. And winter is when all the leaves fall from the trees. All the. Fr- Does that happen, you know, in the Amazon? All the leaves fall from the trees in the rainforest? Yeah, I, I don't know. Falls to the ground. Everything goes dead. Everything goes barren. But we know that there's a spring, and spring is always resurrection, always new life. Do you know that the first year, or the, excuse me, the first month of the year in Israel is the month Aviv, Abib, which means spring or new life. God counts everything. God begins His calendar with resurrection, with new life. So the title of my message today is The God of Awakening. Yeah, you taste that? Yeah, that, that that's sulfur right there. Yeah, I, yeah, it's really strong here. Wow. Okay, the God of Awakening. Um, <laughs> uh huh. Yeah, this is. And what are you going to biblically do to prove that God is a God of Awakening and that God Himself told you this? Are you sure? Did you check the headers on that email to make sure it came from, you know, at God.com or something, you know? With me, I want to take you on a journey to one of my favorite stories. It's the story of Lazarus. And we're going to pull out of here some truths that I know are going to encourage you. The beautiful thing about the Bible is that, yes, it is a book of history. But I need you to understand it is a book of his story. That's what... (laughs) <laughs> oh man. Do I do I really need to respond to that? Do do I that did okay, just consider this just to be absurd and I'm just going to say this is absurd. This is manipulation here. His story. Ooh. This is a bovine scatology here. Pseudo profound bovine scatology. Story is his story. God, unlike you and I, lives outside of time. You and I are trapped in time. Trapped? I'm trapped in time? No, I was... (laughs) Human beings were created in time, okay? (laughs) We were created to exist in time. In fact, the the very first sentence of the Bible, Bereshit bara Elohim, eth hashamayim v'heth ayaretz, okay? In the beginning. See, there was a beginning, a beginning beginning, you know? And so uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created time and space. And we are creatures who are not trapped in time. Help, I'm trapped in time, man. Get me out. No. (laughs) (sighs) Okay, (laughs) we continue. So God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The three dimensions of time, past, present, and future. And what God did and how God behaved in times past is exactly predictable patterns of how he will behave in your life and my life today. And all- oh, man. So this is, our, this is our exegetical issue here. He's looking for repeating patterns that will then predict what God will do in the future. So there's no biblical text that says that God's a God of awakening. But what he's going to do here now, using this r- really false way of approaching the Bible, we're, we're going to look at, a pa- at something that happened in the Bible, you know, and since this is repeatable pattern that will predict what God's going to do in the future, we can go to a text regarding resurrection. Ah! So do you have a dead business? No problem. Jesus is going to resurrect it because God has a predictable pattern. No, no. 
I'm sorry, but uh, you know, at this point, there, there may be people legitimately who are Christians who are going to be declaring bankruptcy. Their businesses will be dead. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to stay dead. Jesus has not promised to resurrect them because of some repeating pattern thingy. Okay, so uh, you might have to find a, a different way to serve your neighbor for the purpose of paying your bills. That's how that goes. What we need to do is just learn the lessons of faith that activate God. This isn't very popular. <laughs> what? <laughs> the lessons of faith that activate God. Told you he had an activation thingy. So there are... Okay, this is so bad. This is blasphemous. Backing this up, we got to hear the blasphemy again You will here. behave in your life and my life today. And all that we need to do is just learn the lessons of faith that activate God. This. Oh, man. So, you know, so if you're, if you're dead business, it was killed during COVID-19 pandemic, if your dead business isn't resurrected, well, you didn't learn the lesson of faith that was necessary in order for you to activate God. It's not Jürgen Mathesius' fault if your dead business isn't awakened uh, by God. It's you. You didn't do the proper thing to activate the awakening thingy. Isn't very popular preaching in a lot of circles, but you need to understand. I got saved on a beach. I didn't grow up in a in a Bible believing home, and I didn't have a theological upbringing. I had an encounter with Jesus Christ on a beach, and so I might be a little. <laughs> I have no theological training whatsoever. I've never been to seminary. Uh, yeah, but I, I had an encounter with Jesus on a beach. <laughs> Remember the Monty Python movie, The Holy Grail, you know, where King Arthur was, you know, talking about how he became king because, you know, because uh, of a sword and, you know, a water ceremony and stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and people were saying, so we have to believe you're the king because of some weird quack aquatic ceremony. Okay, so I, I got to believe you're telling me the truth that you hear directly from God and God gave you this message two weeks ago. Why? Well... Because you don't have any real formal theological training, but you did have an encounter with God and Jesus on a beach. Oh, yeah. Sign me up, man. Yeah, yeah. Just forget all those other guys. You know, this guy's, you know, he's got an inside track. Really? Or unorthodox. But I got to tell you, I discovered that God ha works in predictable patterns. The Bible says in Psalm 103 that God showed Moses his ways and the children of Israel, his acts. Yeah, Psalm 103, verse 7, which you just quoted out of context, even out of context, doesn't say that God has predictable patterns by which we can then predict what he's going to do in the future. It just doesn't say that. He made known his ways to Moses. Yeah, he did. His acts to the children of Israel. Indeed, he did. But it, you know what it doesn't say? And God revealed his patterns to Moses and the children of Israel learned the patterns so that they can predict what God's behavior will be in the future. Psalm 103, don't say that even out of context. God showed Moses his ways. In other words, God, God showed Moses how he moves and why he does certain things. <laughs> oh, this is so bad. <laughs> I want you all to know that my intention was that this was going to be a shorter episode of Fighting for the Faith, and now that I'm into this, it's it's not. <laughs> so, so my apologies right now. Uh, what he just did is called Isa Jesus. Okay, Ice E I S Ice means to read into the biblical text stuff that ain't there. All right, so he just Ice Ajited. Yeah, let me back. This up, and you can hear what he isogeted here. So the text in question says, Psalm 103, verse 7, God made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. And you'll know, it doesn't say nothing about repeat. He revealed his patterns by which you can predict his future behavior. It doesn't say that, but watch what he does here. And the children of Israel, his acts. God showed Moses his ways. In other words, God... God showed Moses how he moves and why he does certain things. Moses knew what God would do in any circumstance before God did it. Whereas <laughs> I don't even think he believes what he's saying. No, God didn't. And the text that you just read doesn't say that, Jurgen. 
Oh man, this is bad. Children of Israel, they, they were only aware of his acts. They were only aware of what God did after the fact. I want to lead you today. So do you want to be able to predict what God's going to do in the future? No problemo. A guy who had an encounter with Jesus on a beach and no theological training is going to tell you how to find the pattern so that you can predict what God's going to do in the future. And if you believe this, I have a bridge in Brooklyn. I would love to sell you on the cheap. I, yet I promise you, you will. the price will be too good to pass up. In a place where you can experience God's awakening on your business, on your marriage, on your finances, on your family. Okay, backing that. This guy is, this is a con, man. This is a con. And they were only aware of his acts. They were only mm -hmm. aware of what God did after the fact. I want to lead you today in a place where you can experience God's awakening on your business, on your... I, I want to experience God's awakening, man. Yeah because of patterns that you're going to show me that are, make it possible for me to predict what God's going to do in the future. Really? Marriage, on your finances, on your family, on your relationships, whatever you've lost in this season, you better believe that the same God who is the Lord over winter is the same God who's the Lord over spring. And all it'll cost you is 10% of the gross income that you have presently. You got to keep tithing even if you lost your business, your job, or whatever. Uh-huh. He's the Lord over summer, and summer all the way through the Bible is hot. And he's also the Lord of fall, man, when everything comes apart. So what's your point? But come with me right now. We're going to go to a town called Bethany, and it begins in John chapter 11. Now, this is the part where I'm going to fast forward because he's, he's going to actually read the text out. But notice, we know exactly what he's going to do. Regardless of how many verses he's going to read, he's already made it clear. What he's going to do is say, see, here's a pattern. And therefore, we can predict what God's going to do. And I've already told you, God told me, because I had an experience with him on a beach years ago, he told me that uh, that he's the God of awakening. And so we can look at this pattern. And, and if, are you struggling right now? Did you lose your job? Did you lose your business? Is your marriage falling apart? Have your Did your dog run away? Well, don't worry. God's the God of awakening because, you know, the same God who's the God of like winter is also the God of spring and summer. He didn't mention fall. But yeah, 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 yeah. So this this is this is just on the up and up. So you already know he's going to manipulate this text, and we know exactly how he's going to manipulate it, but I don't want to be accused of taking him out of context because that's what people accuse me of. So we're going to keep him in context, but he gets to sound like a chipmunk. Okay, we continue. Here we go. Now, there was a man named Lazarus who was sick, and he was from Bethany, which is the village of Mary and Martha. And that's the same Mary that poured the anointing oil on Jesus' feet, the beautiful perfume, and she washed mm -hmm. and wiped his feet with her tears in her hair. When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, they said to him, Lord, the one that you love, the one that you love is sick. Now, let me just say this. Sometimes we think if something bad happens to us, maybe God doesn't love us. If we went through the COVID-19 and a family member contracted it, or maybe we got fired from a job, and maybe it was between you and another guy, and they kept the other guy on, and they fired you, and you can think, man, look, you know, I come home, my kids are fighting, my wife's not happy, the dog bit me, and now God doesn't like me. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible says the one whom you love is sick. Just because Jesus loved him didn't stop him from being sick. And just now, this is true. You know, the, the, our circumstances are not an indicator of our relationship with God. Uh, wages of sin is death, and each and every one of us dies, and uh, and sometimes we die quickly in our sleep. That doesn't happen to many people, but it happens, and other people, well, you know, they get a disease that takes them over a period of time, and, and, and there's just a slow skid into the grave. And other people, you know, it happens a little quicker than that. Uh, but the thing is, is that the fact that you are sick or dying or you have a terminal disease or you even have a disease that has uh, limited your ability and you're going to have to live with it for the next, you know, five decades. That is no indicator of whether or not Christ has forgiven you or whether or not Jesus loves you. So that's true. Sick didn't mean that Jesus didn't love him. But come with me in the story. I know it sounds negative, but come with me in the story. Jesus says this. His response is, this sickness will not end in death, but it's to the glory of God. This sickness will not end in death. Now... We're going to go down a little bit further, and the disciples say to him, hey, you know, you just got the report, we're going to go to Bethany and see Lazarus. And Jesus said, no, 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 we're on mission right now. We're going to stay here a few more days. I've got an assignment here. And they're like, yeah, but, but I thought... <laughs> Jesus said we're on mission right now. No, he didn't. He didn't say that. You added that to the text, too. Oh, okay. And your dear friend Lazarus is sick. And Jesus said, I know, Lazarus is falling asleep, but I'm going to go there and wake him up. And I said, oh, well, that's good. If he's falling asleep, that means he's getting better. And Jesus like, oh... Why don't you just read the text? It, the text is actually better than the way you're you know, misquoting it. No, he's dying. He's, got, he's dead. And I'm glad for your sakes I wasn't there. Well, when Jesus finally arrives in Bethany, the Bible says when he arrives there, he finds out that Lazarus has already been in the tomb for four days. 
That's in verse 17. He finds out he's been in the tomb for four days. And Martha comes out of the house, and Mary's too brokenhearted. She stays in the house. So Martha comes out, and she greets Jesus. And this is what she says to Jesus. She said, Lord, if only you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Hint, hint. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. Martha, being a good little uh, good little Christian, good little churchgoer, good little uh, Shabbat schoolgoer, says, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Now watch what Jesus says. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, sweetie, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet will he live. In other now this is the important bit, okay? So note what Jesus says. And let me pull this up in the biblical text, because this is where he should be putting the emphasis, because the promise that Christ is giving is here. All right, so uh, so we're up to yeah. We'll start at verse twenty one because you know he's been telling the account and actually you know he's reading most of the text. He kind of inserted a few things in the early part of it. But verse twenty one, Martha said to Jesus, "Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died." True, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. So Jesus said to her, "Your brother will rise again." And here's kind of the big deal. Okay. I, do, do you know anybody who's risen from the dead? You know, after receiving a death certificate, you know, which, by the way, uh, usually people who receive a death certificate are now able to grab hold of it. Okay, so having received a death certificate, do you know anybody who, you know, just a few days later went oh, and woke up and, you know, and rose from the dead? None of us do because that doesn't happen. All right. So Jesus is saying, we're all going to rise from the dead. There's a day coming when Jesus will return in glory and he will call us all out of the grave. And so Martha thinks that he's referring to the day of the resurrection, which, by the way, is a great promise because death doesn't get the last say. Jesus, who conquered death, does. So big deal, big promise here, a promise that we will all rise again. All right. So Martha said to him, well, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Perfect catechism answer here shows she's she's been paying attention to Jesus's preaching. But now Jesus pushes further and listen to what he says. I am the resurrection. You see, the resurrection is not an event. Jesus is the resurrection. He is the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die. Notice you Okay, though you die, yet shall you live. Anyone who believes in Jesus, even though he dies, yet shall he live. But the promise is even greater than that. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Okay, now wait a second. I, I, I everybody I know who's a Christian, you know, Christians have been dying for two millennia. Jesus is saying there is some aspect to this where you you do not experience death, all right? I don't know how that works out, I, but man, that is a promise from God. And Jesus says to her, do you believe this? I mean, this is more than just everyone's rising on the last day. This is more than that. And Jesus is the resurrection. And the promise then is for everyone who believes. What that, what, what will happen? Not that your business will be resurrected, you will. And even though you die, yet shall you live, and you won't even, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Wow, this is mind-blowing, and it's huge, okay, to believe that, that death has no power over a Christian, none, and that Christ will raise us up on the last day, and, you know, and to eternal life, all given as a gift. This, These are the promises that Jesus is talking about. And so Jesus pushes her and says, do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. Great confession of faith, by the way. All right, so all that being said, I mean, you don't want to misappropriate these promises because here's the thing. When you make a promise for God that God hasn't made, God isn't obligated to keep that promise, and you're lying in his name, which is blasphemy. So keep that in mind. Let's go back here. I go, resurrection goes. I met Jesus Christ on a beach 34 years ago. I didn't find religion. I found resurrection. When I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, he didn't add rules and regulations and guilt trips and hang-ups and say, well, you can't do this because that's fun. You can't do this anymore because that's fun too. If you don't want to go to hell, then... Are you sure you uh, you actually had an encounter with the real Jesus and not some imposter named Jesus 
what is this? So I'm going to back this up. I'm going to back this up. And this part we're going to play at normal speed because notice this, this so-called experience that he has is the validation that he's given giving for what he's going to say next. How, do, how can we trust Jürgen Matthias? Well, he had an encounter with Jesus on a beach. So uh, let's, um, let's keep going now at normal speed. At the last day, now watch what Jesus says. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, sweetie, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus didn't call Martha sweetie, dude. Wow. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet will he live. In other words, where I go, resurrection goes. <laughs> no. <laughs> So Jesus' words mean what they say because Jesus said what he meant. <laughs> Jesus didn't mean to say, where I go, resurrection goes. Wow. I met Jesus Christ on a beach 34 years ago. I <laughs> what did he look like? Was he wearing puka shells? <laughs> How long was his hair? Was it feathered? I mean, <laughs> what is this? Find religion, I found resurrection. When I had an encounter with Jesus Christ, he didn't add rules and regulations. Oh, by the way, there are rules and regulations that go along with the new covenant. You sure you were talking to the biblical Jesus? Guilt trips and hang ups. Yeah, Jesus said that when he sends the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin and unbelief. So the, you, if you're being convicted of your sin, there's generally a feeling of guilt associated with that. You sure you were talking to the biblical Jesus? Say, well, you can't do this because that's fun. You can't do this anymore because that's fun too. If you don't want to go to hell, then that's not what I found. What I found when Jesus came into my life, I found resurrection life and resurrection power. At, at a what exactly is the cash value of the phrase you just said? Resurrection life and resurrection power. What exactly are you referring to? In church, we're not here to preach religion. God didn't send me from Sydney to San Diego to... Are you sure God sent you at all? I mean, I'm. it's... This, this, uh, meeting Jesus on a beach somewhere, you know, down under, it's, it's looking a little sketchy here. Are you sure that the God of the Bible sent you? If this city religion, to bring religion into your life. The word religion comes from a Latin word, religio, which means uh, regulations. That's where we get regulations. God loved the world too much to give him another religion. In fact, Jesus died to end religion. He died to repair a seven and broken relationship because of our sin. Well, yeah, that's kind of true. But see, here's the thing. You, the way you're sloppily describing this makes it sound like there are no commandments left. And there are. Nine of the Ten Commandments are rolled back into the New Covenant. Just read the back end of Romans and you can see that. And, and so you'll note that Christians are not set free to sin. They are set free in Christ from sin. And, and so that's, that's a big difference altogether. And you're going, well, what's a sin? Answer, look at the commandments. Anything contrary to the commandments is a sin. So and and it it's not just in in deeds it's also in thoughts it's in your words it's in the things you do it's in the things you don't do. So uh yeah so this is sloppy this is really really sloppy making it sound like there's like there's no morals at all for Christians that they need to observe or or keep. The answer is we do. We through through the power of Christ through the through the active work of the Holy Spirit, God then empowers us to mortify our sinful flesh so that we walk in newness of life, in love towards one another, and in good works. Okay, so I, again, this is just weird. You know, if I were to come up to him and say, you know, uh, Jürgen, um, you know, there, there's a biblical text in the New Testament that says you shall not commit adultery, and it's, it applies to Christians in the New Covenant. Would he say, well, that, that's just religion, man. Uh, yeah, I, I'm all for re I'm relationship, but stop trying to put your regulations on me. You see, it, when you start seeing it like that, it doesn't make any sense. You get what I'm saying. We continue. It's about rebellion against God. 
Jesus hung on a cross so that you and I could have relationship with God. He hung on a cross so that the severed relationship that we have as a result of our sin, that we can be pardoned of our sin, and that once again, God would, well, he would adopt us, he adopts us back, and now our relationship with him is as forgiven, adopted children. This is clearly laid out in Scripture. Jesus is resurrection life follows baby. So then Jesus takes a few more steps and then now Mary comes out and Mary does the same thing. She goes, Lord, if only you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And then she's... All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speed through this part again here. <clears throat> yeah, back to Chipmunk. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. When Jesus sees Mary weeping, he sees the hopelessness. The Bible says it's the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. Then Jesus wept. Now I want you to come with me. Have a look at this. Watch this. The Jews then said to him, verse 36, see how he loved him. Verse 37, but some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Interesting. I want you to know three times, if you would have been here, this would not have happened. If only you would have come, my brother would not have died. Could this man not have kept this man from dying? Watch this. So now Jesus comes to, to the tomb. And the tomb was a cave with a stone rolled against it. That's how they used to bury people in those days. And uh, mm -hmm. Jesus says to, to Martha, he says, Martha, take away the stone. Roll away the stone. Martha loves her brother. The Middle East, the, the, the commerce of the Middle East, the values of the Middle East is shame and honor. In the Western world, it's, it's more a, uh, a justice and law, sin and judgment, righteousness, not in the Middle East. In the Middle East, it's honor and shame. She says, Lord, I don't want to roll away the stone. He's been dead for four days. This is the Middle East. The sun's beating down. If we roll away the stone, you know what's going to come out of there? A foul stench. Her words are literally, by this time, there is a bad odor for he has been dead four days. Watch what Jesus says. He says, Martha, did I not say to you, did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he prayed, Father, I thank you that you're here. I know that you always hear me. But I'm saying this so everybody here can know that it's possible to have relationship and access with you. And when Jesus finished praying, he cried out saying, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says he was dead. The man who had been dead for four days, the man who had been decomposing for four days, got up and came out of the tomb. What was dead came back to life. What was decomposing was now resurrected. What was alive. What was dead came back to life? How about who? So note here, by switching it from the personal who, the man who was dead came back to life, to changing it to something that's really kind of vague that we use about things. What was dead came back to life. That's a, that's a major shift here in the focus because we, like I said, we, we, we know this because of the opening of the sermon. What he's going to do here is say, this is a repeating pattern so we can predict what God's going to do in the future. All right? So Lazarus went from a who to a what? Yeah, I'm going to back that up and I'm going to slow it down. Okay? And uh, let's... Mm, wow, this is, uh, this is frightening. We continue. But I'm saying this so everybody here can know that it, it's possible to have relationship and access with you. Yeah, you inserted that into the text too. That's not in John 11, nor is it implied. When Jesus finished praying, he cried out saying, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says he was dead. The man who had been dead for four days, the man who had been decomposing. Yeah, the man, the man, the man, and then watch the shift. Four days, got up and came out of the tomb. What was dead? What was dead? Then there's the shift right there. He went from a man to, you know, if being a who to being a what? Back to life. What was decomposing was now resurrected. What was lost was now revived. I want you to know that God is a God of awakening. See, there it is. Uh, you know, he made the switch. Now God is a God of awakening. Wow, see, this is a pattern in Scripture because, you know, it happened... <laughs> it happened once. Okay, so it's a pattern in Scripture, so we can predict what God's going to do. God's a God of awakening. God told this to Eurgamathias two weeks ago. And remember, he had an encounter with Jesus on a beach, you know, so, okay. That it may look dead. Your financial prospects for 2020 may look dead. You may have been saving for a home and it looks dead. You may have been saving up for a wedding ring. It may look dead. You, you may have planned a wedding and had to move the wedding because of the social distancing and the, the, the shutdown. And, and Do you think that John 11 applies to any of those things? It doesn't. The promise that Christ makes is that he's the resurrection and the life. And the one who believes in him, even though he dies, yet shall he live. And then the one who believes in him and lives, he will never die. That's what Jesus said. That's the promise. And it's referring to whose? P 
people, not what's. Body is allowed to be within six feet and we're not allowed to have large gather, gatherings together. You may have had to put it off, but I want you to know that whatever looks dead, whatever is dead, one word from God, one word from Jesus. That's why I love serving Jesus because at any time he can send a word into my world. Send. Yeah, Christ has the power to, if you wanted to, to make your, your business that's failing succeed. He can, but this is not a promise that he will. And you claiming that this is a pattern that thereby we can predict God's actions in the future and his behavior in the future makes it so you're making a promise for God that he hasn't made. Word forth into my circumstances and death can come back to life. He wants to awaken your business, awaken your hopes, awaken. He, he does. He wants to awaken my business. How do you know that? How do you know that people who are watching you or listening to you, if they have experienced a business failure, that God wills for their business to be resuscitated? How do you know that? And what's going to happen to people and their faith in Jesus and their belief in Christianity if God says, nope, your business is going to stay dead? What about those people? Your dreams, awaken your prospects, awaken what was lost. God wants to awaken my dreams. Give me a break. Awaken what died, awaken what COVID-19 robbed from you. Our God, the God that we serve, is an awakening God. Now, let me give you three quick thoughts. Three quick thoughts. The first thought that I need you to catch, point number one, is preventionist versus resurrectionist. Preventionist versus resurrectionist. What? The world somehow got to... Are you a preventionist or are you a resurrectionist? <laughs> That's a thing? That's a distinction? I think he just made it up. Together with the committee and, and somehow we decided without God being involved, we, we kind of didn't invite God to the committee hearing and to the party. We just as earthlings got together and we decided, okay, Lord, we have gathered together and we have decided that thou art from henceforth known as a preventionist. Lord, this is insanity. This is insanity, Jesus, you know, reading crazy into the biblical text. This isn't a thing, Jurgen. You're... <laughs> All the council of men got together and said, Thus saith the, the people, the, the, you, God, now therefore are preventionists, God, rather than resurrectionist thingy. Uh, this is not, I, I'm going to, I'm going to switch channels here. <laughs> now, a little bit of a note, I've got to warn you, uh, Tabner Smith is a fellow who doesn't allow us to critique him without giving us grief. Uh, and he manipulates the copyright system on uh, YouTube. So we will be transforming him I have no idea what my uh, editor is going to do with Tabner Smith, but if you're sitting there going, why does he look so weird and why does he sound so funky? You know, the reason why is because he doesn't allow us to critique him unless uh, unless we want to go through uh, torture in the uh, YouTube uh, copyright system. So, you know, since I'm not, uh, I'm not into torture and tribulation of that kind, we're just going to really transform him. So that's the reason why. All right, so all that being said, this is his uh, Easter Sunday sermon, and uh, although he's using a different biblical text, it's the same technique. We'll just watch all it. All the great stories. Uh, I want to jump right into my scripture today. Uh, if you would let me, I want to go right to the scripture, so if you'd follow me. There's nobody there. There's an echo. You think they're going to rush the stage and hogtie you if you read the scriptures? <laughs> if you let me? <laughs> we can hear the echo here, Tabner the screen, I want to read together uh, in Romans, Romans chapter 6, it says this, you can read on the screen, you can follow on your Bible, however you wish to do that. Ro okay, Romans 6, by the way, great passage. Um, if you haven't learned that uh, your baptism is a weapon against sin, uh, Romans 6 teaches this, all right? So let's take a look at this. So, so what shall we say then? Paul writes, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means, no way. How can we who died to sin still live in it? So when did you die to sin? Well, watch what he says. 
Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death? So when you were baptized, you were baptized into Christ's death and into his resurrection. So we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the idea here is, is that you, you, you've died to sin. You, you, you dead already. All right? When did you do that? When did you die? when you were baptized. So if we have been united with him in a death like his, and we have, that's what Paul is saying, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like him, his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. And this is what Paul is telling us to believe. You know, so when sin comes knocking on your door and says, hey, would you like to come out and play? You say, no, I don't have to obey you. I've died already, and I'm free from you. That's the point. So yeah, yeah, that's what Paul's getting at. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will no longer never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. All right, so that's what the text is about. Let's take a look at what Tabner is doing with it, which is not going to be good. Satan Satan says this. Could it be any clearer? Notice he's quoting from the message. You should not be preaching from the message. That's not even really a paraphrase. It's just bad. With Christ, a decisive end to that sin miserable life. Listen to this: no longer at sin's every, at every beck and call. What we believe is this: if we get included in Christ's sin conquering death, we also get included in His life saving resurrection. We know that when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was a signal of the end of death as the end. Never again. Oh, the message makes me so frustrated. It's hard to sit here and listen to this without going. Anyway, okay. I'm just going to clench things and try to make myself sit through this as uncomfortable as I am. And will death have the last word? Come on, somebody needs to say amen right there. When Jesus died. Somebody has to say amen right there. And you can hear the echo. There ain't nobody there to say amen. What is he going to do? He took sin down with him. But alive, he brings God down to us. So from now on, think of it this way. Sin speaks a dead language that means nothing to you. What? And God speaks your mother tongue. What? Oh, this is so bad. And you hang on to every word. You are dead to sin and alive to God. Yeah, that's true, indeed. Read the verses, like verses 1 to 5, and you'll find out why. That's what Jesus did. I want to read that last sentence again. You are dead to sin and alive to God. That's what Jesus did. I want to take the next few minutes on this Easter Sunday, and I want to speak to you on this subject, the comeback. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Flee! Run away! Run away! I can't believe we're going to do this. Okay, okay. Come on, somebody needs to get excited right there. There is nobody in the building to get excited. <laughs> You're all by yourself there, Tabner. A comeback. I'm telling you, it's your comeback season. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's not my comeback season. I've got more gray hair now in this season than I had in the last one. It's not my comeback. It's it's my wheels are going to fall off. The leaves are going to fall, and I'm going to crump season. To make a comeback like nobody ever imagined. I, I was thinking about that, about comebacks. You, 
you were. You were thinking about comebacks. Why? Everybody loves a good comeback. I, I remember one in my own life. I remember. I'm sure you do. In high school, we didn't have any good basketball team. <laughs> I think. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. I, I think that uh, <laughs> Tabner Smith is the Uncle Rico <laughs> of the Secret Driven movement, man. <laughs> Watch me throw that football over that mountain over there, man. Yeah. If coach would have put me in fourth quarter, we'd have been state champions, no doubt. No doubt in my mind. <laughs> my oh, no. entire 9th, 10th, 11th grade year, but my senior year, we had a great team. We were 23 and 0. We made it to the state tournament. We got to travel down, and it was awesome. Our fans came. We played in an arena. It was so much fun. We were beating teams like crazy. Nobody could even get near competing with us in the league that we were. It's just like the resurrection of Jesus, man. But that opening game of the tournament, the semifinals game, we played a team that I think was really a little bit better than us. They really outmatched us. They were bigger than us. They were stronger than us. They were faster than us. And gosh darn it, people liked them. They were pretty much better than each of us on our team. And we were used to beating people by 20 and 30 points. And there was a moment with a few minutes left in the last quarter of the game that I looked up at the scoreboard and we were down by eight points. And I remember putting my... I was kind of leaning over trying to catch my breath. I remember putting my hands on my knees and I looked down at the floor and I thought, it's over. And then I had this picture. I had this picture pop into my mind about one time we were walking through this flea market and someone was airbrushing t-shirts and, and, and air, with paint and, and they had this t-shirt that had this duck. And the duck was eating the frog. But the frog, before it was going in its mouth, had its hands around the duck's throat. And then the shirt said this, don't ever give up. And I know that sounds cheesy, and I don't even know why that came to my mind. But I-, I don't either. Yeah. Because I, I don't see the connection here to your text. I looked up with a new passion in my heart, and I didn't even ask the coach. I just called a timeout right there. Somebody was- Notice he's retelling this account of you know, his Uncle Rico moment. And uh, it, it, with with precision and accuracy, but uh, he doesn't apply that same precision and accuracy when it comes to the biblical text. The free throw, I called a timeout. We walked over. Man, I went berserk. I was yelling at everybody. We didn't come this far to lose. You better get it together. Get on defense. I mean, I was going at it. We came out of that timeout. I played defense like I had never played defense before. We went after it like we haven't gone after it all year. And can I tell you something? We ended up winning that game. I still remember it to this day. 20 years later, it was a comeback. Right on, man. Yeah, wow. I feel closer to Jesus after hearing that. <clears throat> not really. Maybe that's not your story. Maybe you didn't play basketball, but you can probably think of a time where you were a little bit down and out and you made it back. Maybe you can think of... Yeah, I, listen, when I was in junior high, I attended a small, tiny, uh, you know, Christian to junior high school. And uh, <laughs> every time we played another team in sports, if if we won, it was a miracle, okay? <laughs> and uh, and that miracle rarely ever happened, rarely ever <laughs> happened. So, yeah, there were no there were no comebacks. I mean, if if we won a, if we actually beat another team, we were thinking, man, the poor team there. Everyone had the flu, you know. Everyone was, you know, you know, that's the only way we were able to win, you know. Sports teams that you like that were down and they made it back. Do you know why? Why do we always come back? Why? Because we were created by someone who is the king of the comeback. <laughs> Jesus is the comeback king. When he comes back, he ain't going to be th- thrilled with the way you're mishandling his resurrection. Wow! It is instilled in us from birth. It, the, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that created the best comeback in history, lives on the inside of us. The king of the Yeah, 
I know I went to a Christian junior high school. How come the king of the comebacks didn't help us win any games when I was when, when I was a kid? How come we lost everything all the time? If the king of the comebacks is about the king of the comebacks, I mean, we could have used a few of those. <laughs> Why are you yelling at me? <laughs> I, don't, I don't have enough energy to do a comeback. I'm tired. You need to look at somebody in that room where you tap them on the shoulder, jump up and down, turn around. You need to do something. You want him to jump up and down and do the potty dance. Why? And just say it out loud. It's my comeback season. Oh, good night. <laughs> I feel like I'm torturing myself, but because I'm sharing this with you, I guess I'm torturing you. It's our comeback season. It's time for a comeback. It's time, man. It's time. Says who? And you know, I'm really speaking a little bit deeper today because I really... That's not possible. You're not speaking deeper today because a kiddie pool, as long as you're in a kiddie pool, is still only six inches deep. I believe that it is time for your comeback with your business. I believe it's time for oh. your comeback with, your, with everything going on with your work. It's your comeback for your business, man. And with school and with family and friends and all of this type of stuff. It's time for a comeback. The... It, it's time, man. Yeah, you know, because Jesus, you're the comeback king, you know, lives inside of you. This is scratching itching ears and making promises for Christ that he hasn't made. So what happens when your business doesn't come back, when your job doesn't come back? Well, it's your fault. You didn't activate or something, you know? Virus is being diminished. That God is, is completely doing away with that, and he's healing people, and he's turning this thing around. You know, it's, it's a significant number of weeks past Easter Sunday, and uh, it's still around. You know, we're barely getting open at this point. I don't know about you, but since Holy Week, since there's been a shift in some things, y'all. The hospitals are getting less and less. I'm just believing in it. Yeah, there's a shift. He believe, He's believing for a shift, man. That's a prophecy bingo word right there. In Jesus' name, if it only starts today, people are getting better and better. If it only starts today, we're coming back from this thing. But I came to... We will eventually, yeah. Talk to you about a deeper comeback than that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, so so he went deeper in the kiddie pool. He went from you know the surface down to the one inch mark, and now he wants to take it down to two inches. Man, done. I I'm tapping out again. Uh, this is uh, yeah, this is misappropriating the resurrection indeed, and that's not what the resurrection account is about. That's not what Jesus's resurrection are being united with him in his death and his resurrection ain't about that either. And the promises of God have nothing to do with God saying, I promise that your business is going to come back, that your job is going to come back. No, the, the, the reality is you might not even come back. The question is, do you believe Jesus even if nothing comes back and you end up dead? Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. There's a day coming when Jesus will call you out of the grave. He's not going to, he may not call your business out of the grave, he may not call your job out of the grave, and he hasn't promised to do so. He may do that and he may not, but your the promises of God are not regarding that. And, and to say that the resurrection has anything to do with this is to twist God's word, make promises for God he hasn't made, and give people false hopes, which then when those false hopes turn out to be false, will shatter their faith in Jesus. They'll walk away from the Christian faith saying Christianity isn't true. The reality is they haven't been taught true Christianity, and that's the problem with this kind of preaching. Hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can support us is down below in the description and, uh, and, and how to share this video so that you can share it with others. And if you don't already support us, we do. Uh, we depend upon the support of our people that we serve. That's you, our audience. And if you don't already support us, all the information on how to support us is also down below in the description. And everybody who joins our crew at Gunner's Mate and above in the month of May, I will send you one of my fine art prints. This is the one uh, Alvarado Grain Elevator. I shot this a few weeks ago as my way of saying thank you 
for supporting us in the work that we're doing. So until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by Jesus Christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of our sins. Amen. (laughs) 